you. Your Excellency. I've never been, you've never called me that before. <laughs> well, you've never been an ambassador before. That's a really solid point. Yeah, I, I haven't. So good to be back home. It's fantastic. Well, welcome it's, back. We miss you. No, no, well, I miss you guys too. It's uh, good. It's good. It's good to be in DC, but it's uh, good to be back in New York. It's good to be back at the Asia Society, and seeing as I can, even in the gloom, so many uh, faces who. Uh, uh, friends uh, from um, the last several years I've spent here. Great. Well, you have put Australia and US relations in, in very good shape, and I presume that means that it's allowed you plenty of time to continue to examine the developments in China, an area of, of great expertise for you. And I've been reading a lot about uh, significant economic headwinds in China, about youth unemployment, and also about sort of palace politics, hmm. purges, and other of these sort of mysterious uh, doings of, of Leninist authoritarian systems. Can you help us look behind the curtain and, and just give us a sense from your perspective based on your long uh, hmm. efforts looking at China, what, what, what's going on in China? What's this? What's the state of the, of the union in the People's Republic? Well, we've been asking that question for about 50 years uh, about the PRC, and uh, sometimes we get it right and sometimes we don't. So, um, and these are kind of my personal reflections. They don't reflect any considered analytical view on behalf of the Australian government. But I, I do read the stuff. You know, I read um, their official literature and I follow the debates, and we talk to people uh, when they are um, travelling. Uh, to the United States uh, out of China. So putting all this together uh, is uh, sometimes um, complex. I think in terms of the core question of the economy, and we should probably start there, uh, the fact that growth uh, has been slowing now for so long uh, is not an accident. Um, uh, it's not the product of um, you know, a hard landing uh, post-COVID. Uh, it's not the product um, exclusively of external economic factors like um, declining trade and declining foreign capital flows. <clears throat> it largely comes from conscious ideological decisions within the Chinese system by Xi Jinping himself uh, to move more to the Marxist left over the last five years or so. Uh, and you trace this back uh, to the 19th Party Congress in 2017, we see this series of statements which says we want to reprioritize the role of state and enterprises. We want to put new constraints around the role of private firms. Um, and not just Jack Ma and Alibaba, but a whole bunch of them. Uh, we want to uh, begin to implement a doctrine of common prosperity, which is about income redistribution. Um, we want to think more carefully about how much we are taxing corporates. Um, and you put all that together, um, that the flow through effect that it's had on uh, business and consumer confidence over five years or so, has been quite negative. Um, and these things tend to build on each other. And these are the constituent elements, I think, of a much slower period of economic growth. Uh, I think the other thing to be said is that in the, the, the modern history of the Chinese Communist Party, the social contract between party and people has always rested on growth of around about 6%. That's been historically calculated as the benchmark through which you generate enough uh, increased economic activity to continue to liberate people from poverty, continue to increase living standards, and overall uh, contribute to a better quality of life. And so, and that has been an enormously stabilising thing for 35 years until it wasn't. Um, and you've seen that start to unravel in part as well. That brings us to the present, and I'll come to politics in one second. So I think in the back of the mind of um, President Xi Jinping as he comes to um, San Francisco this week uh, for the APEC summit, um, together with his bilateral summit with um, President Biden, um, how to uh, kickstart 
China's economic growth is actually in the forefront uh, of his mind. On pure politics, the other part of your question, Danny, uh, the way in which uh, I would see it is that notwithstanding um, recent purges of Qin Gang, uh, the uh, former foreign minister, and of Li Shangfu, the former defence minister, and of the so-called second artillery, which is the rocket force within the PLA, allegedly on grounds of corruption. These sorts of purges actually have been going on for the last 10 years at one level or another through the agency of the anti-corruption campaign. So when people ask, therefore, when people, I think, uh, too rapidly conclude, therefore, that Xi Jinping leadership's in trouble, I think that is a wrong conclusion. Uh, it's the Marxist-Leninist state which controls power through the security apparatus, the intelligence apparatus, and the folks who um, are able to be the enforcers of the system. And I see no evidence that that's unravelling. Are people underneath it all um, uh, unhappier than before? You certainly sense that in the, uh, the wider body politic and the wider economic community and the entrepreneurial community. Um, but to conclude from the above that therefore Xi Jinping's leadership is somehow tottering, I think that's a false conclusion. So I think that's the kind of environment uh, we'll be confronting, uh, the President of the United States will be confronting and other leaders when they meet with Xi Jinping this week. Would you agree that there's been a steady shift in the direction of comprehensive security that has impacted economic policies, certainly in the sense that First and foremost, we saw in the crackdown on big tech platforms that Xi Jinping and the party leadership was just not going to tolerate a competing center of power. Mm. And secondly, that he seemed not to want uh, the cream of China's youth wasting its time and brain cells on frivolous things like consumer products and online games, and instead they should be building hypersonic missiles and advancing artificial intelligence in support of the nation and the military. And studying Xi Jinping thought on the weekends. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, if only there was an app. That's right. And, uh, and you don't even have TikTok there. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the securitization of everything is a core part of what Xi Jinping would describe as his new development concept. If you language matters a lot in the Chinese political system because it's a Marxist-Leninist system and they communicate much but not all through the code language of, um, of ideological formulations. Mm. So everyone here remembers the period of reform and opening, uh, Deng Xiaoping. You couldn't have any Chinese leader on this stage uh, from the time of uh, the beginning of the reform period in 78 through until 2012, without the words reform and opening, reform and opening, reform and opening being the central organising principles of the mantra. And they actually, they meant something. What do they mean? They meant that uh, we will now submit the uh, allocation of resources in the domestic market, the Chinese economy, increasingly to market forces to distribute rather than the state. And opening was the code language for and we'll submit ourselves to the disciplines of the international market as well, uh, which means that uh, we'll sell as much as we can, we'll import as much as we can, and that will introduce new efficiencies into the Chinese economy. That was kind of, you know, kind of the mantra, well, it was the mantra for 35 years. Again, I go back to the 19th Party Congress, which is where I see so many of these origin points as lying, including on security. Uh, when you uh, look inside the entrails of the 19th Party Congress, it proclaims a couple of things. We're now into a new era, Xin Shidae. Um, secondly, this new era uh, actually comes after the reform and opening period. Thirdly, the economic strategy is no longer reform and opening. It is called the new development concept. And what is the new development concept? It's kind of made up of two sets of things. One, in the language, pardon, pardon the uh, opaque nature of it, one part of the language is something called the dual circulation economy. Um, I'll come back to that in one second. And the second is the securitization of development, which is your point. 
What's the dual circulation economy mean? The dual circulation economy means that um, we, the Chinese economy, will grow in the future in a manner much more driven by domestic consumer demand, less dependent on international trade, less uh, dependent on international capital flows, and in their assessment also uh, less determined, uh, determined uh, less dependent uh, on uh, public infrastructure investment. And then the relative role of what's called foreign circulation begins to fade away or lessen. In other words, if you unpack it, what it's saying is we in China want to become a much more domestically driven economy in the future, less dependent on the world outside. And by the way, the subtext of that is increasingly nationally economically self-reliant and less dependent on the international economy because of security, which then flips into the other concept, which is uh, what you referred to before, which is we the party are concerned about our domestic security and our international security. At home, we don't want our data uh, to be within the control of the uh, Alibabas and the ten cents of this world. We want the state to have a much more central role. And, and internationally, we don't wish to be vulnerable to international technology and international capital markets. And so that explains the new thrust in Chinese industrial policy as well. But the net effect of these two big changes the dual circulation economy model, the securitization of the economy, all form part of what Xi Jinping calls the new development concept, all of which replaces reform and opening. It's the flow through effect of these macro changes which send signals through to the marketplace where private entrepreneurs are saying, I'm not sure that's as good for me as it used to be. So what do you do? You keep your cash under the mattress. What do you do? Um, you perhaps try to get your cash out of the country. Uh, what do you do? You're going to invest in another project worth 10 years of your savings in the next expansion of your uh, widget factory? Maybe not. I might postpone that. And so when you look at the private fixed capital investment numbers in China, they progressively become worse and worse. So I think this is a big factor, and none of it is by accident. Uh, my final point here, Danny, would be Xi Jinping embarked upon this because he was concerned about the private sector having too much power in China, and he's concerned about data being in the hands of the private sector and not the right. state, and he's concerned about the security of the state, and therefore these things will take priority over previous reform and opening pro-market models. Well, part of the paradox, I think, in both the, and in the combination of dual circulation and securitization is that part of dual circulation, the dual part was uh, after making China less dependent on the world uh, to sustain or increase the world's dependence on China as the, you know, the uh, manufacturer for the world and so on. And that hasn't worked well. Uh, China's having more and more difficulty investing abroad, selling abroad, and the securitization drive has led to, if not decoupling, then uh, de-risking and diversification. So where, where, is, where does that leave uh, Xi Jinping right now? I think if you're looking at China's macroeconomic circumstances, there are these dual sets of problems that you've just referred to. One relates to domestic business and consumer confidence. And because that has been knocked around for the reasons that we've just discussed, um, and because uh, domestic consumption represents a huge driver of GDP growth, that has a negative um, wash through in terms of overall growth numbers. But the second factor, the second drag on growth, is what you've just described. If you look at China's net capital uh, inflow outflow, if you look at uh, the trade balance, these are historically in much worse shape than they have been in recent history. Uh, and so therefore, the argument underpinning the dual circulation economy, as you said, which is we, China, will be now more domestically driven, but because we are so huge, the world will need our market. Uh, they will therefore sell lots to us and become increasingly dependent on our market, and that's good for China. You can also leverage some foreign policy influence through that. Right. 
And in terms of capital markets, it's such a big market that we'll have the world's biggest financial institutions take increasing uh, stakes in the Chinese domestic economy. And guess what? Because they become dependent on that. Therefore, uh, that also provides a further uh, item of leverage in the international economy. Except decoupling brought all this unstuck, uh, or at least de-risking uh, leading to decoupling. So I think one of the issues very much in the front of Xi Jinping's mind when he comes to San Francisco is what can he say or do mm -hmm. here in the United States, uh, and therefore in a global APEC audience as well, which makes up a huge slice of global activity when you've got Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, Australia and the others all in attendance. What can he say or do uh, to rekindle international investor and trade confidence, even though domestic confidence equation will still be suspended over here for the ideological reasons I referred yeah, to before. That's an incredibly important question. I, and I want to come back to it, but before we get to San Francisco, let's take a quick detour to Australia. And it's just over there. Just take it. To the, <laughs> get to the water, and it's two, Keep going. two movies in a sleep. <laughs> A good sleep, I would say. <laughs> a long sleep. Yeah. Um, so taking advantage of your uh, stature and status uh, oh, as yeah. <laughs> Australia's representative, not to mention yeah, right. former good. prime minister, yeah, um, right. could you tell us a little bit about Australia, China in 2023? What, what has been the, the rhythm uh, of the bilateral relationship and, and what has changed in terms of uh, the Chinese side of the equation? I think it's fair to say that for the previous several years, the bilateral relationship between Australia and China has kind of been in the freezer. And uh, you know, you open the freezer and there's some stuff up the front of the freezer, which is usually frozen meat. Then there's some stuff behind that, which you forgot to take out and it's looking a bit bad. <laughs> And then there's the stuff behind that. That was the Australia-China relationship. And, is, there, uh, is there Vegemite in there somewhere too? <laughs> hey, yeah, we just had our 100th anniversary of Vegemite. Congratulations. Thank you. And, it's uh, all yours. I've never, in my years at the Asia Society, I never managed to convert anyone to Vegemite. Yeah, I noticed the gift store still doesn't carry it. The gift store's not carrying it. Uh, Deborah Eisenman, our, uh, our uh, chief operating officer, uh, once tried it. I've never seen such a look of monkey and horror on, on anyone's face. It was like a replication of the scream, the painting. Um, I've told her that if you liquefy it, you can actually use it to start your car. But there you go. Where do we get to with all that? It was that we were talking about Australia. Anyway, we're back in the freezer. So uh, that's where it was. So the objective of the incoming uh, Labor government in Australia under Prime Minister Albanese and Foreign Minister Penny Wong um, has been pretty simple, straightforward, quite analogous, I think, to what the Biden administration has been seeking to do, albeit at a much more complex level. Um, and that is to stabilise uh, the Australia-China relationship. And the core element of stability in any relationship is to keep the channels of communication open. So we'd been through this ridiculous period where we hadn't had uh, prime ministerial visits um, in either direction for about seven years and that ministerial level contact between Australian and Chinese government ministers had uh, been frozen for effectively three years. And a whole bunch of trade barriers or trade sanctions been imposed as well. Um, and through uh, China's use of uh, coercive measures uh, in response to a proposal by a previous Australian Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, uh, to con that there should be an independent global inquiry the origins of COVID-19. All of that happened, so the objective which um, uh, the new government has had is how do you reopen the arteries of political communication and of more normal commerce. So 80 months later, basically, they've achieved that through a whole lot of fairly patient diplomacy. But the interesting thing, if you look at the subtext of it, and people ask, well, what did the Australians give up as a result of this process of stabilisation? They, they didn't actually, they, they didn't change any policy posture on anything. AUKUS has continued uh, with bipartisan support as a security measure, which Beijing does not support. Uh, the Australian government did not back down on any of the economic coercion measures. Uh, 
uh, took the uh, Chinese government to the WTO disputes resolution uh, processes. The Chinese subsequently indicated that they'd like to now review these bans. And at least one arrested uh, Australian um, citizen who's been a journalist, Chung Le, has now been returned to Australia. So these as concrete steps in stabilisation, I think, have been uh, useful. Uh, does it mean that the uh, relationship has been completely normalised? Uh, that's a separate question. Um, but Kevin, if the main shift on the Australian side, other than the change of government, was better statecraft but not big concessions on contentious issues, then is it the Chinese side that did the most to sort of drive the thaw? Did they have the greater interest in uh, moving to normalize or to warm up the relationship with Australia? I think there was a general conclusion in Beijing that Australian governments, be they of the centre left or centre right, uh, are unlikely to turn around and say, oh my God, we should have been much nicer. Um, you know, that's kind of not our nature. Uh, the, uh, so, in fact, if you try to tell Australians what to do um, by the application of coercive pressure, it's likely to have the reverse effect. That's just the way we are. Uh, so I think there was a conclusion in Beijing that this ship was not for turning, that is, the Australian government, in terms of any fundamental shift in Australian government policy. So I think that's true. Um, what I think shifted more broadly, however, was uh, Beijing's global calculus that um, it had overreached in terms of, let's call it, the age of wolf warrior diplomacy. Wolf warrior diplomacy was something we would happily talk about uh, day in, day out a couple of years ago because there were so many examples of it. Mm -hmm. uh, if I was to ask you today what are the current living examples of wolf warrior diplomacy, there aren't many. Um, so if you were to look at that as a question of change in China's foreign policy posture, I think that's a conclusion deep within the system in China that there'd been an unnecessary alienation by a series of Chinese actions of countries not just in the Indo-Pacific, but countries in Europe and, uh, and, uh, and others as well. So I think the stabilisation in Australia was the product, uh, you know, not just of the efforts of the current Australian government, but also of a wider change, I think, in Beijing's assessment of its overall situation in the world, which had not improved and, in fact, gone in the reverse direction. Interesting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. In fact, I think you can apply that same template to the uh, relationship with the U.S. in the sense this, this notion of uh, global recalibration of their messaging and their tone Mm. Um, I mean, w one thing that's so striking to me on the Chinese side is the shift over the course of 2023 in language from what uh, at one point we were hearing from uh, State Council or uh, Director Wang Yi and others to the effect that the, China can't be expected to cooperate with the United States on these global challenges like climate and so on, while the United States is disrespecting China's core interests, not abiding by uh, the one China principle and not satisfying us uh, by talking about Xinjiang and complaining mm. about Hong Kong and flirting with the Taiwans and so on. That kind of conditionality and linkage has shifted and in the last uh, few months, certainly in the last few weeks, we've been hearing from Xi Jinping, his interest and determination and cooperation and working together. There are a thousand reasons why the U.S.-China mm. relationship should be good and no reasons why it should mm. be uh, fraught and so on. I've also seen on the American side something of, a, of an adjustment from, for example, decoupling to de-risking mm. and uh, from strategic competition to what Jake Sullivan said over the weekend about strategic, or excuse me, competitive interdependence, a really interesting formula that is, I think, quite subtle. Now, I think on the U.S. side, some of this is the benefit of experience, fine-tuning, just the way that the 
Biden administration has been fine-tuning its export uh, control systems and so mm. on. But on the Chinese side, do you also see a big shift in, in messaging? Yeah, very much. I mean, it is as you described. If we had two bookends here, one was uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken's uh, encounter with um, uh, Yang Jiechi, um and uh, in Anchorage. Um, Don't remind me. Uh, which was what, about a year in to the new administration? Uh, barely. Barely a year. On, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, and here we are two years later with the most recent Wang Yi meeting uh, with um, uh, Secretary Blinken and uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan in Washington a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is kind of chalk and cheese. This is, is that an Australian expression? Apparently. I'm sorry. <laughs> these are quite different. Uh, these, these represent, I would say, almost polar opposites. Um, so the question which arises analytically is um, why? Um, so I think on the Chinese side, uh, and remember, I think we've had a discussion on this stage um, uh, last year, Danny, with uh, Susan Thornton, that book that Susan wrote called Overreach. And um, Susan Shirk. Uh, Susan Shirk. Don't say Susan Thornton. Susan Shirk. And um, and Susan's uh, um, concept of overreach. Uh, I think it was an elegantly phrased book. Um, and uh, and I think this permeated into uh, the official class in in Beijing that this is in fact what had happened. That's point number one, and that China was therefore as a consequence with uh, several years of wolf warrior diplomacy losing far too many friends or potential friends around the world. Two, then roll in the real world economic problem of declining growth that we spoke about before. And therefore, what do we need to fix that? Well, one of the things you need to fix that is to actually bring down the level of geopolitical tension measurably, not just rhetorically, but measurably. Because international investor houses in this city, New York, uh, but elsewhere in the world, these folks are not dummies. They do their math. They work out um, what is the real world risk of crisis, conflict and war across the Taiwan yeah. Straits and the South China Sea. They're looking out five to ten years in terms of large scale uh, foreign direct investment projects and or portfolio investments. Uh, and they are making conclusions based on geopolitics. Geopolitical risk is a real factor in the largest investment institutions in the world. So I think in the calculus in China, it's been to reach a conclusion which says, if we wish to help the international factors driving China's better growth performance improve, then we must materially set about doing something to stabilize geopolitics. And so I think that's part of the prism again. Uh, we'll see how far that goes uh, in terms of the summit this week. But if your question is what I think is driving all this at a political, diplomatic and national security level and economic level, I think that's what's in the back of the Chinese leadership's mind right now. Stabilisation. Yeah, and to add one point, given that I'm one of those uh, guys who still reads the People's Daily, and um, and uh, it's a, an old, old addiction uh, from uh, the 1980s when I used to work in our embassy in Beijing, and that's all you had to work out what was going on. But it's the way the system talks to itself. It's the official organ of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. So I noticed a couple of weeks ago, Danny, just the language used in the official commentary describing uh, the uh, upcoming um, sort of summit between the president uh, and Xi Jinping. And I noticed that the normal formula which China uses for these things, which is that the proper framework for US-China relations is no conflict, no confrontation, mutual respect and win-win cooperation. Yeah. And uh, which, if you have that as a phrase and, and then compare it to the reality of US-China relations, it's kind of like uh, disconnected in its entirety. Chalk and cheese, I'd say. Chalk and cheese, thank you. <laughs> thank you. You're, you're catching on. Chalk cheese and, chalk cheese and Vegemite. And so, um, uh, but I noticed in this most recent commentary that the language subtly perhaps had begun to change. 
um, the language began to say something long, like this, that competition should not be the only factor defining the US-China relationship, that we needed to talk about red lines of a strategic nature, without saying Taiwan, but that was the inference, but there should also be a room for cooperation. So suddenly what I see is sort of a slow crab walk um, boom, 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 uh, from previous formulations to this new, looser set of formulations by the Chinese side, saying we need to find other fr uh, framework landing points with the United States, uh, conceptual landing points with the United States, to authorise the system beneath us to have a more adversarial set of engagements with the US as well. So how this turns out on, uh, later this week, I still can't predict but I'm just looking for uh, straws in the wind, and there is a, a few straws there. Wow, well that is fascinating. That's much more than a straw in the wind, I think. That's pretty powerful. And look, if in fact the Chinese uh, leadership is uh, shifting its position from a pretty rigid, absolutist, uh, competition is an unacceptable framework for the relationship, no, uh, turn around, go back to your side of the Pacific, to an acceptance of the concept that competition is something that is built in, that needs to be managed, um, and that uh, there are landing points to aim at in the US-China relationship, then that strikes me as pretty promising. I happen to know that Xi Jinping and Joe Biden in the past, and you know the past is not an accurate predictor of the future, both of them have evolved their positions have changed, but when they were vice presidents, they were able to have a genuinely strategic mm. dialogue, uh, delving into what the other perceived in their domestic circumstance, in the international circumstance. So I'm wondering when we look at the meeting tomorrow, uh, there's four hours budgeted. Um, now admittedly, this is only the second in-person meeting between the two leaders in uh, the Biden administration. Uh, and for an entire year after Bali, it seems like Xi Jinping misplaced his iPhone or Huawei phone because he wouldn't take Joe Biden's call. But nevertheless... Well, the balloon went up and the balloon came down. I think well, there was that. Yeah. But it seems like there could be, uh, based on the straws you've plucked out of the wind, uh, a chance for the leaders to have more of a strategic discussion about stabilization. What do you think? Well, I think uh, both you and I would hope so, um, but we still don't know so. What I do see, though, is um, a set of changing interests on China's part, uh, which push it in the direction of how do we stabilise geopolitics. Um, one of the most concrete indicators of that beginning to occur, Danny, as you know, um, is uh, what happens on the future question of the resumption of military-to-military -military dialogue mm -hmm. between the Chinese and the American armed forces. This has been um, suspended now for, what, three years? Yes. Yeah. And so this is really dangerous, just really dangerous. Every time there's an incident, no one's there to pick up the phone. So at a very mechanical level, those of us who follow this closely have been um, urging our Chinese friends uh, to uh, get these dialogue channels back open again, and not just Secretary of Defence level, but at the Operational Command level, Indo-PACOM and the rest, because that's where the real live decisions are taken within time frame. As you know from your vast experience, both in the White House and, and in the State Department as Assistant Secretary, these things happen very quickly, um, and your ability, therefore, to contain things really hangs on the ability to communicate quickly and to establish a modus vivendi, as opposed to the Chinese side not picking up the phone or taking three days to pick up the phone, by which time God knows what has happened. So I think one of the further straws in the wind will be, is this reconvened? That is mill to mill. Mm -hmm. But the second and equally important in my judgment, uh, Danny, is this. Um, you can say you're re-establishing mill to mill contact but it has to therefore produce real outcomes, not just crisis avoidance, 
things like um, China's current pattern of uh, routine, almost daily, uh, crossing over the median line in the Taiwan Strait, causing Taiwanese fighter jets to intercept. And each time this happens, we are getting closer to yet a new set of incidents. Um, so it is taking the uh, almost process point of re-establishing dialogue channels between the militaries, but then adding real measures uh, which actually help in the physical deconfliction of both sides. Now, going back to Xi Jinping's econo uh, economic interests in coming to San Francisco, if the Chinese, uh, therefore, are able to produce real measures which take the temperature down through acts of deconfliction, guess what? The international investor community will begin to adjust their calculus. If, however, it's a nominal set of measures, like, yeah, we'll pretend to have some mill-mill talks, but it's not going to go anywhere, then the international investor community is not going to respond because these are deeply pragmatic folks sitting on the top of billions or trillions of dollars, and they've got other places to put it. Well, there's a world of risks that the two leaders are undoubtedly going to want to discuss. Um, certainly, uh, Chinese rhetorical and other support for Putin's war against the Ukraine is an important and constant theme in mm. U.S. messaging. No doubt that's going to be reinforced directly. But the new development is the uh, Hamas uh, attack on Israel and the w w military operation in, in Gaza and the implications for the Middle East. Do you have a sense of sort of what the U.S. and China might have in, in terms of common ground there or uh, how that conversation might unfold? Yeah, I think on uh, the Middle East, uh, we should perhaps look at it at two levels. One is, if there is a common interest, as I would see it, and I'm not a Middle Easternist, by the way, I'm a, I'm a China guy, so I, I know what I don't know. And, um, and when I get to the Middle East, I sometimes get lost. Um, so um, It's uh, all the way past Australia and around. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so I think where a common interest lies... Um, is in what both governments were probably saying to Iran right now, which is, do not escalate. Um, any form of horizontal escalation of this conflict uh, is not in either of our interests. From the Chinese lens, why is it not in their interest? Some would say, from a Beijing perspective, the more distracted uh, the United States is on multiple fronts, the better in terms of China's geopolitical interests in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, however, China's global interests now are rebuilding its economic growth. And that means taking the global geopolitical temperature down, not just in the Taiwan Straits. And so if you were to have a global conflagration brought about by Iranian direct participation or unleashing the dogs of war uh, through Hezbollah in the north across the Lebanese border, uh, then I think from a Chinese lens, this would be not consistent with core interests. At a different level, I think the Israeli government uh, has um, uh, had a, uh, a very clear-eyed opportunity, however, to see where China's international diplomatic support has been through this conflict. Um, and that is... Uh, China has, unless you can tell me to the contrary, uh, Danny, and not called out Hamas by name. Uh, no, it's pointed its finger at Israel and the U.S. That's right. It, is, um, it has pointed its finger at the United States. <clears throat> um, it has not, therefore, acted as a force for restraint in relation to Hamas's activity uh, either within Gaza or in the appalling attack of 7 October. <clears throat> And so this, I think, has brought about a new sense of reality in the Israeli government in, among the uh, broader political class, not just Likud, but the rest of uh, the political establishment uh, in uh, Jerusalem, that uh, China has deep interests in the global south, which are deeply associated with uh, the Palestinian Authority, 
deeply associated uh, with um, that particular cause and is not about to sacrifice those broader foreign policy interests by calling out Hamas for what it's done on the 7th of October. Well, I, I think that, I agree. I think that's, a, if anything, an understatement because it, it certainly looks like the Chinese are taking advantage of this conflict as a, uh, an opportunity to showcase the U.S. somehow on the, I the think wrong it, side of the and equation. And there's a danger for Chinese diplomacy here too in giving real pause for thought uh, if you're in Riyadh, if you're in Abu Dhabi, if you're in the Gulf Monarchies, looking at how China has responded uh, to this in a manner yeah. which is not about, shall we say, problem solving. Yeah. Well, I've been irresponsible and greedy and just asking you question after question. I could go on for a long time. I've got a lot more questions, but I owe it to the, your loyal followers to uh, provide an opportunity to ask a few questions. So um, if there are questions, and reminder, a question is a sentence with a question mark at the end. Um, maybe we could take uh, to begin two questions. We have people on the aisles with mics. I can't, I can't see very well if there are any hands up. Um, yes, there's, I see a gentleman over there, and I see a gentleman over there. So please, quick question. Yeah, thank you so much for your talk. Um, my question is, what can China realistically offer the West to turn down the temperature um, in the Indo-Pacific? West is also you know, American allies and so on. Um, because I think many would view the situation in Australia as emboldening, that if you don't back down, don't give China what it wants, it will end up conceding. And so therefore, you don't want to negotiate with them until you have more of an advantage. Got it. Question mark. What can China offer to the West? Yes. Um, please. Yes, could you comment on the evolving chip war among China, Taiwan, and Silicon Valley? Hmm. Sure. So let's go to uh, what can China offer. And um, I, um, uh, this is just an analytical view. It's not a a policy view because Chinese government haven't um, extended their uh, briefing papers to me. Um, but I go back to what I said before about the core question of geopolitical stabilization. And that is both a US interest, it's a pan-regional interest, and it's a Chinese interest. So the question is, how can this be brought about in reality, not just by saying we shall have a more stable region when at the same time uh, all the um, uh, military assets continue to grow and become more intense in their deployments and therefore the, the uh, possibility statistically of collision, crisis, conflict, war, escalation uh, goes accordingly. So building on what I said before, I think concrete things would be uh, for the PLA, People's Liberation Army, uh, to consider uh, returning to its pattern of exercises prior to the um, Pelosi visit, which is to stay uh, on the west side of the median line in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, the more you cross the median line, uh, the more you're going to have Taiwanese aircraft scrambled and the greater the risk there is of an incident. The second and parallel um, possibility will come with what happens with the Taiwanese presidential elections in January where you have uh, Lai ching uh, who is the uh, uh, candidate for the Democratic Progress Party, and a range of three alternatives, or let's call it the pan-blue or the conservative spectrum uh, in Taiwanese politics. Let's just say uh, William Lai wins. Uh, he's ahead in the polls at the moment, but there are differing interpretations of what might happen between now and January. But if he does, the critical question in terms of geopolitical stability is what does then China then say and do between that election in January and the presidential inauguration which happens in May. China's previous pattern has been to ramp up a series of activities, usually by way of military exercises, sometimes coercive economic measures, sometimes a combination of the above. Not doing that 
uh, again, contributes materially to stabilisation. So uh, that, I think, is something else which could be considered. Could I jump in to yes, tie sure. your answer back to something that you pointed out earlier on, which is that Xi Jinping is going to be speaking at APAC to the assembled international business community and to American and other CEOs. And I think that there is also risk-related reassurance that could be offered, whether how credible it is is an open question, about things like the anti-espionage law, things like the detention of uh, foreigners in China, things like the prejudicial treatment of uh, Western businesses and so on. And it may be that we will hear things and that they will hear things from Xi Jinping beyond platitudes that help uh, reduce a sense of risk and increase a sense of confidence. I think on those questions that you just raised, which are material, if you're sitting in a boardroom uh, here in New York, or you're sitting in one in Tokyo, or sitting one in Sydney, um, or in Europe, and you're trying to work out, are my staff going to be safe uh, in China, given the pattern of arrests which has uh, happened in recent times? Knowing a little bit about Chinese politics, I think it's unlikely that uh, Xi Jinping will stand up before the APEC audience and say, well, we, we overreached on all of that. Um, sorry about that. Uh, we'll ratchet it all back. Um, the, um, I don't UC, think... UCIA spies are, can come back. <laughs> so knowing a little bit about how Chinese politics works, I don't think that's going to happen. But what uh, would be interesting to watch on the ground is whether operationally anything changes by way of the real pattern of activity. Um, the law is one thing, the operationalization of it is another, uh, and the securitization of everything is the overarching frame here. But for material behaviors to change uh, on the ground, but in terms of the APEC audience question, before I go back to chips, um, is um, I go back to what I was saying before in answer to the young man's question over here, which is at the end of the day, um, the core question in the minds of business at home and abroad are twofold. One, how do we get business and consumer confidence rebuilt and restored domestically within China? And if you can't do that, two, how do you give us genuine geopolitical assurance that we're not within reach, ready reach, of a full-blown crisis across the Taiwan Straits? <clears throat> so therefore, when he's speaking to a thousand corporates, however many they're going to be in San Francisco, dealing with the reality of those two things, and on the second, which is the geopolitical risk factor, <clears throat> It'll be not just in my judgment saying it's good that Mill Mill is back, it is be going beyond it in the direction that we were talking about before. Of course, he would not be that explicit uh, in such a speech about what those concrete measures might be, but it's the materiality of bringing down geopolitical risk which will cause boardrooms to say things have changed. Mm -hmm. You can't just get a bit of fairy dust and going, well, geopolitical risk is gone, all problem solved. It just doesn't work like that. Uh, just quickly on chips, um, I think on chip competition, beyond my pay grade, uh, to give you a, de a detailed uh, technical analysis of where the relative standing of competitive lies between TSMC, other chips manufacturers around the world, the United States uh, and the PRC. Other than to say that my overall analysis looking at um, the published reports uh, from uh, people in the field like Eric Schmidt is that by and large uh, the United States um, and its allies still remain significantly ahead in this overall uh, race in chips in terms of um, their size, their computing power and therefore their, um, their um, energy consumption and producing a given unit of computing power. Um, I think China is discovering the limits to its own national industrial policy, that you can't just again apply the fairy dust of a trillion bucks worth of investment and produce a chip uh, 
which is at uh, three as opposed to seven on the bandwidth um, and uh, of, uh, of uh, its um, efficiency. Well, I wish we had budgeted two or three hours, Kevin, because it's really fascinating to talk to you and to listen to you. Unfortunately, our time has run out, and I sincerely apologize for not having uh, built in more time for your questions. The discussion will be posted on uh, the website, Asia Society, and on ASPE, along with Facebook and YouTube and so on. We have another program uh, coming up uh, about APAC right after APAC. I think on the 21st, if you check our website, um, you'll see it. I hope you'll sign up for our newsletter and join Asia Society, as, as Deborah suggested. I hope you'll also uh, take the opportunity to look at our great exhibition uh, down upstairs at Meiji Modern. And lastly, I invite you to join me in thanking our terrific speaker, Kevin Wright. Come back.